Uh, thanks, Mike. Got it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's still a little early here on the West Coast. I'm kind of waking up, but uh, here we go. Um, so I've been in a group of uh, 12 people that have been meeting sort of every Thursday, actually about this time. And uh, so we're not meeting today. <laughs> everybody I think is probably here, but this is a group that's, um, that's uh, involved in thinking about these things that I'm gonna talk about. And I wanna especially mention Sig Baluyat, who um, we've actually been meeting in person, believe it or not, for quite some time now. Uh, I can't even remember exactly how long, but we go into AIM and we had been wearing our masks. Now we're not wearing our masks anymore, but uh, it's been great. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about uh, moments, uh, ratios of L functions, families of L functions, and uh, how that all looks in random matrix theory, which has been, uh, I have to say, random matrix theory has become an essential tool in number theory, in analytic number theory, in studying statistics of L functions. And, um, you know, I think when it first started, people uh, were slightly negative about it, say, oh, you're never going to prove the Riemann hypothesis that way. Well, nobody thinks that we are, but as, as a tool for handling the complicated combinatorics that arise in studying these um, statistics, arithmetic statistics, if you like, statistics of L functions, it's, uh, it's pretty indispensable. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this on my iPad and make that a little bigger. And uh, uh, I think I start off all my talks kind of the same way. <laughs> we know about the second moment of the zeta function and we know about the fourth moment of the zeta function. Uh, Hardy and Littlewood back to 1918 and Ingham back to 1926. So that's almost a hundred years since we've uh, got any new moments of the zeta function. We still don't have a theorem about the sixth moment of the zeta function. And uh, way back uh, in 1980, I was a, sort of a finishing graduate student at the time and um, was in, uh, uh, spent the, got to spend the year in, uh, in Cambridge with my advisor, uh, Hugh Montgomery, who was on sabbatical there. And I went to a conference in Exeter, my first uh, number theory, con my first conference. And um, on an outing uh, to, the, to the Moors, Exmoor, Dartmoor, uh, I forget where exactly. On the bus, I was talking to Heath Brown and he mentioned, he said, you know, we don't even know a good conjecture or any, we don't even know a conjecture for moments uh, of the zeta function. And so that was, well, 41 years ago, but I got interested in the question. And uh, in uh, 1992, uh, Omit Ghosh and I actually figured out a conjecture for, um, for the sixth moment of the zeta function. And that involved uh, this uh, convergent product over primes. We call that sort of the AK, this would be A2. And then we knew about log to the, we knew the power on the log was gonna go up like a square. So three, this is two K at the moment, K is three, three squared is nine. So you got the ninth power, but the mysterious part was this 42. And that's a little surprising because it was so big, you know, one, two, 42. And then, uh, <clears throat> Well, six years later with Steve Gonick, um, we figured out a conjecture for the eighth moment. And that actually had a, now you got an even bigger number, 24,024. And uh, with a log to the 16th. Uh, but um, our uh, method with Gonick, which involved looking at uh, coral divisor correlations, dk of n, dk of n plus h, where dk is the uh, k-fold divisor function, for this one, we were looking at D4, of the average of D4 of N, D4 of N plus H, uh, N up to X or something like that. And we're able to figure out a, a um, conjecture for that. But when we tried to apply that same technique to the 10th moment, uh, instead of a, a nice answer here, we got a negative number. It was an integer, but it was negative. So that was kind of the, uh, the end in some ways of that part of it. But 
along came uh, Keating and Snaith. <clears throat> uh, let's see, what am I doing here? Okay, there, do it like that. Okay. Along came Keating and Snaith at essentially the same time, exactly the same time, really. Uh, and they uh, figured out to average um, the uh, characteristic polynomials right here at, at one over the unitary group, the group UN of N by N unitary matrices, the tooth case moment, and calculated an exact formula for this. And then said, well, we should think of N as being log T in this. And if you look at this as a power n to the k squared, and so this is asymptotic as n goes to infinity, some constant times n to the k squared over k squared factorial. And that constant is exactly this, which if you calculate gives exactly those same numbers that we had for the moments, one, two, 42, 24,024. And uh, well, in case you're interested, the fifth one, the next one will be 701,149,020. And so they made the conjecture that, in fact, these GKs should give you the, um, the two kth moment uh, of this data function. And, um, you know, that's after Montgomery uh, and Dyson with the pair correlation and n correlation had figured out that the zeros of the zeta function are distributed like eigenvalues of large. Uh, either Hermitian or uh, unitary with the compact group is maybe easier to think of, uh, matrices. And um, so, uh, so their logic was, well, if, uh, or I don't know exactly, I can't say, but, um, you know, if the, uh, uh, if the eigenvalues are distributed like the zeros, then maybe the values of the characteristic polynomials are distributed like the values of, um, uh, of the zeta function. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> we actually wanted to go a little bit further than this and figure out the lower order terms. But if you look at the lower order terms of, say, the fourth moment, uh, they're quite involved and quite complicated, right? Uh, the one thing is they only do involve uh, gammas and gamma ones and gamma twos. These are the Stilchy's constants in the Taylor expansion of zeta of s around s equals one. And then they also involve um, derivatives of zeta at two. And that's an explicit formula, but the idea of trying to take that further um, was daunting. But in fact, uh, we were actually able to um, to, well, I say solve this problem, but I mean, it's not really solved, it's just a conjecture, but we were able to figure out something that made sense. Uh, this is CFKRS, uh, Farmer, Keating, Rubenstein, and Snaith. We call this the recipe. And it's a way <clears throat> to write down a conjecture for moments in basically any family. Uh, and this is just the, uh, what happens uh, in the zeta function case. We have some function psi that let's say is supported on, compactly supported on one, two, a C infinity function, if you like. Sorry, this integral is over the reals. And S here is a half plus IT. So we're integrating up the half line, uh, but with little shifts. We have a set A of complex numbers, and a set B of complex numbers. And these should have uh, small real parts, like less than one over log T. The imaginary parts could be quite large, uh, maybe as large as even a power of T. And so this would be the generalized, uh, the sort of most general kind of moment that you might look at for the zeta function. If A and B have size K and you let all the shifts go to zero, then you're just looking at the uh, two kth moment. Okay, and <clears throat> in some sense, the, um, the answer uh, can be written down uh, kind of amazingly in an amazingly con compact form here. Um, it's uh, just the same integral again over the test function, but now you sum over subsets, a U and V of A and B of equal size, 
And uh, t over two pi to the minus u minus v. Okay, let me try out my pencil and see if it works. T, that's really t over two pi to the minus uh, sum over alpha in A, alpha minus sum over beta in B, beta. So that I just abbreviated that by T to the minus U. Oh, sorry, not alpha and U, U and U. Uh, okay, well, all right, I'm not gonna correct it. All right, <clears throat> and then you have this basic function which has an analytic continuation. It's the sum of tau AM, tau BM over M to the S. And tau A is uh, the coefficient just of that product of all the zetas. So tau A is just a convolution of little shifts, uh, the, one, the function one shifted by the little alphas. Okay. And um, we tested this numerically all the way up to, uh, I think like the 28th moment or something like that. Uh, we actually think this error term is a square root size, t to the one half plus epsilon. Uh, we conjectured that in general for all our families, but it turns out for symplectic families, there are definitely some cases where that square root error term is not correct. There's uh, some extra main terms that come in from like quad averaging quadratic L functions. Okay, uh, well, all right, so, so for example, then, uh, from that conjecture, this is what you would get for the sixth moment. Uh, now, the, co the actual coefficients of the sixth, uh, the, of, the of this P3 for the sixth moment, P3 is the ninth degree polynomial here, and um, they're not nice. Uh, numbers they're they're infinite products over primes and sums products and sums over primes that you can't evaluate in terms of any zeta functions so what happened there for the fourth moment doesn't happen here uh but that's an example and you can test that i mean you can test this just using on mathematica it's accurate enough that even just integrating over a small range if you put in these numbers, you'll get something very, uh, you'll get something surprisingly accurate. So uh, we definitely believe it's correct. And uh, there's an analog of this in random matrix theory where it's an, an actual theorem, an exact analog. So uh, let's say you have a A is a n by n unitary matrix, and we're gonna use lambda uh, as a notation for the characteristic polynomial. And uh, uh, it's uh, defined slightly differently th than you normally would. Uh, one minus S times E to the minus I theta N where the I, E to the I theta Ns are the, are the eigenvalues. So when S is an eigenvalue, this is zero, but it's characteristic polynomial is usually written a little differently, but this is how we write it. So it has, so this thing has a nice functional equation that's like the functional equation in some sense for the zeta function. And uh, here is the um, uh, random matrix analog of the recipe. So um, you, uh, your basic function, instead of uh, zeta function, you take Z of X is one minus E to the minus X to the minus one. And capital Z of AB is uh, the product of Z of alpha plus beta. Yeah, so I should say that that, uh, that, that thing we said B of AB before, which was the sum of tau AM tau BM over M to the S, I should have written, oops, sorry. I should have written that down. This is really the product over alpha in A uh, beta in B of uh, zeta, let's make this, uh, sorry, without the S, just M, zeta one plus alpha plus beta, and then times some uh, arithmetic uh, factors. This is a, a product over prime, some convergent Euler factor. So that, so you have, the point is that you have this zeta one plus alpha plus beta looks like this Z. Zeta one plus X has a pole at uh, X equals zero of residue one. And the same thing holds for this, uh, for Z of X. Let me try this. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, anyway, 
so the theorem is that uh, this average of shifted characteristic polynomials, the shifts are now appear sort of as exponentials, is um, it's pretty much the same thing, same formula that I wrote down before um, with uh, Z of you take, uh, you take a subset S of A and then you take, you take A and you kick out all the things in S and add in all the things, all the negatives of the things in T. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, if uh, if if the oops, uh, if the size of S is zero, then you would just have uh, Z of A B. That would be kind of the first term in a way. And that's what we call, we call that the zero swap term. And uh, if, uh, if the cardinality of S and T were one, then you're taking all the singletons in A and all the singletons in B, you uh, remove a singleton from A and replace it with the negative of a singleton uh, from B. That's what this means. Okay, are there any questions? All right, uh, and uh, so the fact that this is a theorem in random matrix theory and matches exactly what we have in um, uh, our conjecture and number theory is encouraging that the number theory uh, conjecture may be correct. Now, um, okay, so I wanna shift to uh, moments of long polynomials. So this is a technique that uh, say Ghanak and I were using uh, when we were getting the eighth moment. We did, the moment and I did something a little different for the sixth moment, but then uh, we recovered also the, the sixth moment from this. And uh, Goldson and Gonick have a paper on how to average long polynomials, uh, average over T long Dirichlet polynomials. And so, so X here is, X is the length. So when I say long, I'm talking about, uh, as far as X goes and X, let's say maybe is T to the eta and long would be eta bigger than one, okay? If eta is less than one, then you have the theorem of Montgomery and Vaughan that uh, the only thing that survives is integration. It's an approximate sort of uh, parcival formula or something like that. That's just a diagonal term that, uh, that survives. But what uh, Golson and Connick did, if, uh, if eta is bigger than one, then you should, uh, you should add in uh, what you get from the uh, off diagonal terms, okay? And so these are like this, which uh, if you organize them according to the difference between M and N, then you have something like this and this, psi hat the log m over n is kind of like just uh, t times h over two pi m. So this is, this is nice and accurate. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, and so to go beyond, uh, to do it, to average a long polynomial, you need information about uh, these coefficient correlations. Okay, and so that's where I was saying that we were looking for information about some n less than x. For the fourth moment, it'd be d4 of n, uh, even d4 of n plus one. So nobody knows how to do this formula asymptotically, even uh, when the, that four is three. So d3 of n, d3 of n plus one. We're completely stuck on that uh, and do not know how to evaluate that. And uh, we actually only need it on average, right? Uh, on some kind of average over age, but we can't do that either. If we could, we could do the sixth moment, but in some sense, that's a kind of the sticking point. And so, uh, but, but we have conjectures using the circle method or the Delta method. Uh, you can uh, figure out conjectures for this. So we know this conjecturally, and then you input that into say the goldston gonic uh, mechanism and you come out with uh, the, those moments, the sixth moment and the eighth moment. So that's how you do it. So what goes wrong for the 10th, <clears throat> sorry, for the 10th moment? Well, 
Uh, we didn't know, didn't know for a really long time. Uh, still, in, in some sense, don't really know, but um, uh, we have taken some steps towards going uh, along that. But I want to point out sort of a phenomenon that happens with these moments. So when you do the second moment, say, of zeta, you can get by with um, just uh, uh, the Montgomery Bond sort of diagonal uh, kind of reasoning in a sense. And when you do the fourth moment, you really need to bring in uh, these divisor correlations, okay? And uh, when you do the sixth moment, then you're gonna need something else. And so what happens is as K, if we're looking at the two Kth moment, as that advances through integers, uh, K equals one, K equals two, K equals three, whatever, then um, you there's some new terms that enter into the asymptotics of that moment. And uh, it's kind of a, it's a funny phenomenon. And it's like, well, what are the, you know, where are the new terms going to come from? And, you know, what's causing them? And we see that in other families too, moments of cusp form L functions, where you're using, say, the Pedersen formula uh, to detect, initially you just detect the diagonal terms, but then you have the other piece that involves the Klusterman sums and then you know, maybe some of the Klusterman sums that degenerate to Ramanujan sums, they might give the sort of next term if you're looking at, a, say, a, a third moment. And then when you look at a fourth moment, you get off-off diagonal terms is what uh, Kowalski and Michelle and Vanderkam called them. But anyway, there, in whatever families of L functions you're looking at, you have this phenomenon that as you look at higher and higher moments, there's new sources of main terms that come into uh, to this. And uh, so we can quantify that a little bit. And that's sort of what this talk is about, is um, uh, what do those new main terms, we don't know exactly where they come from, but what do they look like? And that we can say. And so uh, we're thinking of doing the 2 kth moment of zeta by just looking at a super long polynomial, a large x. And, uh, and, and zeta of s, of course, is, um, uh, Oops. Uh, to the k is summation uh, dk of n over n to the s. And uh, so you're looking at a long polynomial approximation to zeta to the k, and x is going to be, well, I said t to the, so now it's t to the alpha. And uh, well, just uh, this, if you were doing this for some other, uh, not zeta, but some L function without a pole, you wouldn't have to worry about this term. But because of the pole of zeta, you need to subtract this thing off. And we want to know about the uh, mean square of that. And if we scale things right, uh, in other words, um, sort of divide out the log to the k squared and the arithmetic constant a k and the k squared factorial, we get left conjecturally with a polynomial that we call m k of alpha. And uh, for the uh, for k equals two for the fourth moment, these are the polynomials you get. And if you graph them, you get this nice, uh, it looks like it's, you know, nice, completely smooth thing. It is, it's, but it has changes. Uh, there's a change here at one and then a change at two uh, in this. Uh, lots of derivatives are equal at these points. So it is very smooth, but it's transitions from zero up to two. And then it stays at two. In this case, once, uh, once your polynomial, once your x is bigger than t squared, you've captured all of zeta squared. And so you don't need anything else to get the fourth moment. And so you get that two in the, you know, one, two, 42, whatever. That's the two right there. Okay. And uh, here's, uh, yeah, for three, you can work out what that is. We can work any of these out, but yeah, they get complicated. Uh, Let's see. Well, so there's a picture of M3 and M4. And like I said, they're very smooth. This one, M3 goes up to 42. M4 goes up to 24,024. Transitions from zero up to 24,024 through these piecewise polynomial uh, chunks that we're calling MK alpha. And uh, 
Okay, and so, so there's, a, there's an analog and random matrix theory of these. And so I wanna describe that. Um, okay, uh, so uh, we let the uh, polynomial that's a random matrix uh, characteristic polynomial have coefficients that are secular coefficients is what they're called. So SC sub J, the J secular coefficient, kind of a strange notation. And so, uh, how does that work? Well, uh, so Diaconis and Gambard have a uh, very nice formula if you, uh, for averaging these uh, secular coefficients, products of secular coefficients. And basically, if you have equal sums on these things, but those sums have to be less than n, then uh, the answer to this question, uh, to this integral, is uh, it's, <clears throat> it's the number of matrices with row sums equal to J1 through JK, this would be K by L matrices and column sums equal to H1 through HL. Kind of a nice little uh, combinatorial thing that they've done. Uh, now, uh, the connection uh, with long polynomials and the secular coefficients is uh, this, that this uh, long polynomial for zeta should be the average of the secular coefficients now summed uh, J1 plus JK summed up to alpha times N. Now the, the Diaconis uh, Gambard uh, uh, theorem, that only works for Diaconis Gambard is really for alpha less than or equal to one. And so we're interested in what happens here, in fact, when alpha is bigger than one. So extending, it's in random matrix theory, it'd be extending the diaconis Gambard to alpha bigger than one. And uh, yeah, and by, oh, by the way, Sandro proved that, uh, assumes the recipe, which is a CFKRS conjecture for moments, and then proves it, uh, this theorem. Now, um, you can show, in fact, that you can just take um, yeah, you can just take uh, these things uh, equal to each other and just take a mod square like this. And we call this I K uh, M N. And um, uh, Keating, Rogers, Rodney Gerson, and Rudnick have studied this quite extensively. They have a very nice paper. Uh, on all of this, and they evaluate it uh, in, a, in a range beyond sort of the diagonal range. And what they prove is this very nice theorem that these uh, IKs are equal to uh, this quantity gamma KC times n to the K squared uh, minus one plus that big O. And so uh, I think I mentioned that that group of 12 it's called the gamma KC group. Well, that's because we're studying sort of phenomena related to uh, gamma KC. And um, this has a, uh, a nice formula, <clears throat> a nice integral formula. G is a Barnes function and, and delta here is the, the Vandermond. And uh, in fact, it's related to this, uh, this gamma KC is related to the MKCs that I was just talking about by it's a derivative basically. And uh, the nice thing, oh, oh what's, where, where did that come from? Oh, shoot. Uh, I think I got my slides out of order. <laughs> oh no, oh, okay. sorry, I guess that's okay. Uh, yeah, all right, no, <laughs> random insertion of a picture here. This is the, uh, the polynomial uh, that's the sixth moment basically evaluated that uh, the little uh, shift X of uh, characteristic polynomials and summed when, and when N, the matrix size is 25, uh, you get this 25 degree, 25 or 50 degree polynomial. And these are the zeros, kind of a cool pattern, yeah. I'm gonna say more about that later. Uh, all right, sorry, back to where I was. Uh, so uh, what, what the K R cubed uh, and also Rogers and sound 
uh, have worked out are uh, arithmetic um, uh, <clears throat> uh, instances of the gamma KC. And so one of them is about um, divisor function in short intervals, a subject that Steve Lester and many others have studied for uh, quite some time. But you take DK of N and you look in a short interval and uh, average that. And then you've got these two parameters, X and H, and they're related to each other in some way. And in fact, uh, what KR cube says is the way they should be related is in fact by, um, uh, by this formula where C is if log X over divided by log X over H should approach C. And then you should get this gamma KC, which is itself a, polyn a piecewise polynomial function uh, smooth uh, that comes up in you know, moments of characteristic polynomials. And uh, so, uh, so you can prove that, in fact, the recipe uh, implies uh, implies this. <clears throat> uh, so that's in a paper of Sandro and Zenmine. Um, and uh, oops. And <clears throat> same thing for divisor function and arithmetic progressions. <clears throat> So you sum dKn now over n's congruent to a mod q, and you sum over the q's and take this variance. And uh, now x and q are related by log of x over log q should be c. And this also, the behavior of that gives you gamma kc. So what happens <clears throat> then is as this ratio log x over log q gets larger, that's your c, as that passes through integers, then you get a change in behavior of this uh, divisor function in arithmetic progressions. And this gamma KC describes exactly how that change in behavior works. Okay, I see I'm going way too slow. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanna <clears throat> mention that uh, Bayser, Gee, and Rubenstein, uh, this is a, sort of another theme I'm very fond of, is that um, they found a pan levey equation that governs the gamma KC. So pan levees are a little obscure maybe to number theorists, but I, I think they're really important and they're becoming more and more uh, present in, especially in this uh, arithmetic statistics, uh, but they are a, a big staple of random matrix theorists. And uh, so I like to encourage thoughts along pan levee lines whenever possible. And <clears throat> basically they found a determinantal expression for, uh, for uh, gamma KC in terms of kind of like a, uh, what you might call sort of a double Ronskian <clears throat> like this. <clears throat> and um, it turns out there's a Lewis, there's a formula of Lewis Carroll uh, about uh, these double Ronskians. That's a recursion formula for these things. And you can apply that and get a recursion formula then for the uh, gamma KCs. And that's typical of a pan levey equation, differential equation. You get this, uh, you get, diff you get uh, recursion formulas. And that actually enables you to calculate much, much further than you would otherwise. So if nothing else, that's a reason to find the pan levey is you can do a lot more calculations. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now you can do this for any L function. You take any single L function <clears throat> and look in T aspect. And you can do exactly the same thing. So you can study the, uh, so the moment, if it's one, just one primitive, let's say in terms of like Selberg class L function, then the moments are basically gonna behave the same way as the moments for the zeta function. You'll get exactly the same GKs uh, from Keating and Snaith. And uh, you can do all the same, so you have a recipe for those, you can do all the same stuff. You have the same gamma KCs, and that relates then to, if you take the convolution of the coefficients of your L function and look at them in either short intervals or in arithmetic progressions, then you're gonna get the same gamma KC uh, behavior. Okay. Definitely, okay. All right, so there was two things I wanted to do. And one is that there's kind of this amazing 
uh, well, surprising factorization that, that happens for, uh, for moments in, uh, for characteristic polynomials. And so, uh, well, I just wanna explain that. So first of all, it's useful in our moments formula to change everything into polynomials or rational functions. So before we had sort of e to the minus alphas were our shifts. And so now what we wanna do is um, make a change of variable that e to the minus alpha is just a. And then all these formulas, so this, so this is now the formula for um, moments, but um, the z is now just a rational function. And uh, this is the uh, moments formula. S to the n is just the product of all the s's and little s uh, to the n. And so you have a rational uh, expression. In fact, it's a polynomial. So this is just a polynomial. And um, so I wanted to write down the um, moment formulas for all three groups, for unitary, symplectic, and uh, orthogonal uh, matrices uh, in this notation. And uh, so now we have sort of three different uh, Z functions, uh, the Z for unitary, the Z for orthogonal, and the Z for symplectic. And um, one thing you might notice is that um, the ZO times ZS is actually equal to the ZU of, in this case, XX. And that's kind of a hint of the multiplication, uh, the factorization we're gonna find. But um, for uh, a symplectic, uh, uh, so here's a product of shifted symplectic characteristic polynomials averaged over a symplectic group of size 2n. And so you just get this formula with the ZS thing and it's X minus T plus T minus. So this means Take your subset T of X, and uh, this is just this is just T bar, the complement, and then uh, and then add in the inverses, one over T's. Before it was negatives, but now with this add, uh, multiplicative additive, whatever notation, it's now uh, you throw in the one over T's. Okay, and so these are the uh, how to average characteristic polynomials over all three of these groups, and. Uh, Let's say you were looking at a unitary and you just had a four of these, A, B, uh, with shifts A, B, and also A, B. Then uh, this is the formula you get. You can, you can calculate this in Mathematica or whatever. And uh, that's what you get for that, uh, that matrix. And if you take M equals two, for example, uh, you get, uh, it's a polynomial whatever M is, this thing boils down to a polynomial, even though there's this uh, denominator here. And it factors, M equals three, it factors. See, it, it, there's a factorization. And for four, it's a factorization. And it turns out in this factorization, the first factor is the fourth moment uh, for the symplectic group. And the second factor is the fourth moment for the orthogonal group. And, um, and, uh, and this is true, it's a theorem. Uh, I uh, showed it to Estelle Baser and she figured out a proof for it using Toplitz and Henkel, Henkel matrices. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And uh, you can use that then to give a relationship about the gamma KC functions. You can define a gamma KC for unitary, which is what we've done, but you can also do it for orthogonal and symplectic. And, uh, oops, did I not write it down? Well, it's a convolution. Basically, the unitary gamma KC is a convolution, uh, you know, in the sense of, yeah, of um, gamma K uh, S and gamma K U. I think I have it written down later, which, okay, I'm clearly never going to get to. Okay. So here's the, yeah, here's the theorem is that uh, the unitary moment of size M, if you put in uh, A and A, so you have to take B equals A. It doesn't work for A and B, but if both of these are the same, A and A, then that factors into a symplectic uh, and an orthogonal. So I don't know what that means for L functions. It's like the moment that, you know, two kth moment of the Riemann zeta function is somehow related to the, um, to the kth moment of, 
you know, quadratic L functions times the kth moment of uh, 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 cusp form L functions. That would be a symplectic and an orthogonal. Oh yeah, so here's, uh, yeah, okay, here's the convolution formula. It looks like that. Okay, so, uh, all right, uh, okay. So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna have to skip this stuff. So one of the things that comes uh, out of um, these um, recipe formula, it turns, the recipe is actually re they're really powerful. This, this way of writing these averages of characteristic polynomials so that they match like zeta functions. It's not something the random ma matrix theorists would have thought of because they're not thinking about zeta functions. So this is sort of a new ingredient into random matrix theory that comes from number theory. It's like, well, we're trying to figure, do everything so that it matches up with the way that we do moments in number theory, which is you take some approximate functional equation and then you average, you have some averaging formula and you average term by term. Well, that's I'm random matrix theory, so obviously don't do it that way. And so our recipe, the CFKRS thing, is sort of a new ingredient. And it turns out it's really powerful. And in fact, it gives a simple proof of the diaconus gambard uh, thing that I mentioned earlier. But uh, I also said that that was only for a very limited range. And in fact, uh, SIG has worked out that you can do this in any range. And so he has formulas for diaconus gambard in, in any range whatsoever, not just sort of the first range. And I was gonna give you a proof, but we'll skip that. Uh, and instead, uh, because I wanna talk about ratios. So you can do all this stuff, not just for um, moments of L functions, but for averages of ratios of products of L functions. And these are the things that you need to study zeros, like if you're doing zero correlations or whatever, you do ratios. And what it turns out is uh, the formulas are actually very similar for ratios as they are for moments. So now we have, um, we have the same Z function as before, the Z of two variables, but now it's a four. So Z, A, B, C, D, we want to be Z, A, B, Z, C, D over Z, A, D, Z, B, C. Okay, and then uh, uh, the thing that we're going to average is a product of character uh, ratio of products of characteristic polynomials with shifts either for u or for u star. And the formula looks just the same, except there's this extra CD that just tags along. And, uh, and it's you know, defined by, by this. Uh, so for example, if you just took one, uh, uh, one uh, letter for each of these, then uh, uh, this average turns out to be sort of exactly this thing. Well, okay, so we wanna do the exact same thing we did before with, uh, look at this thing in the case, let's say you have AA and CC and uh, it factors. So the ratios factors also. And uh, uh, these are the formulas for how to average ratios uh, or the formula for how to average ratios over the symplectic group. Now you just have a ZS of AC, which is uh, curiously ZSA, ZO of C over ZU of AC. And um, this is the formula for averaging those ratios. And uh, it turns out that these uh, rational functions that you get are exactly sort of the first factor in uh, each of these things. And uh, when you do this for the orthogonal, you do the same thing. And so you end up with a factorization that um, uh, the uh, uh, ratios for unitary factors, uh, in the case where you take sort of the same, uh, in the numerator, you take the A and B to be the same set, in the denominator, you take the C and D to be the same set, and then you get this factorization. And so we can prove that also. Uh, okay. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Okay, so somehow, okay, so there's a Y missing here. There should be a Y in this thing. Um, okay, so one, so one of the things that I think is, would be really great to understand 
is moments of the logarithmic derivative. Uh, so zeta prime over zeta shifted by a little bit and the two kth moment of that. And that should have, by all rights, there should be something good about that. The coefficients are, uh, uh, if it was zeta are sort of uh, supported on almost primes. And uh, if you could figure out average of this, then you can do uh, sort of things like almost prime, average almost primes in short intervals uh, or, uh, yeah. Um, and, uh, okay, I realize I've got like a million little formulas everywhere. Okay. But uh, so, uh, so we've been studying these moments of logarithmic derivatives of characteristic polynomials and trying to understand the structure of those. And, uh, okay, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of this, but we can calculate these uh, up to a certain point. And um, uh, we can figure out uh, lots of properties of these things. Uh, but uh, I just want to show a couple pictures. So this is the zeros of that average. So this is a, uh, so when you, there, there's a denominator that's obvious and when you get rid of the denominator, well, I guess it doesn't matter. It's that you're just looking at zeros. So for K equals four, so that's the eighth moment and N equals 75. This is what the zero set looks like. And uh, we saw kind of a similar sort of concentric uh, zero set earlier with the um, moment polynomials. Now there, there was three rings and uh, that was a sixth moment of a characteristic polynomial. And that formula has sort of three swaps in it. You know, the S equals T sets uh, could go up to size three. And that's why we think that there's three rings there. And in this one, there's just two swaps. The swaps somehow come later, like they're not going to be three swaps until you get up to the 18th moment. But if we could calculate the 18th moment of this logarithmic derivative, we believe if you looked at the zero set for like a large n, you'd see you know another ring uh, around this thing. Now uh, here's a picture of um, zeros of um, so some of the pan Panlevé equations have polynomial solutions. And these pan solutions come in families. So you have a parameterization and you have families. And so you'll have a sequence of polynomials. And again, uh, when you look at those uh, zeros as the parameter gets larger and larger, you get these beautiful patterns that are kind of concentric. I mean, um, you know, ever and ever larger sets of zeros of the, the same shape. And so people have known that about pan polynomial and rational solutions for a long time. And so what I wanna claim is that in fact, the zero sets that we're seeing here for these moments of, uh, and, uh, and, log and moments of logarithmic derivatives indicate that there's a pan uh, or a recursion formula at the very least hiding behind these things that, that's waiting to be discovered. And so, that is act, uh, one of the things that we would like to do. Okay, um, all right, I think I'm out of time. So I'm gonna, oh, I had a, um, the other thing I had was a proof of, so Diakonis Shashahani, you probably haven't heard of it, but it's a pretty famous result in random matrix theory that involves averaging uh, products of powers of traces of characteristic polynomials. And again, that only is for a very limited range way at the beginning. And what happens is this formula, this is actually a formula that uh, Nina Snaith and I found a number of years ago when we were looking at um, uh, n correlation uh, of uh, zeros of the zeta function, trying to provide lower order terms for all of the, like for the, uh, specifically for the n correlation of zeros of the zeta function with all the arithmetic factors and everything. Anyway, so it turns out you can use that. And uh, again, you have these sort of uh, swap terms. And the zero swap is just when S and T are empty. The one swap wouldn't be when S and T are singletons, two swap, you know, when there's two sets. Well, so we can give a proof of um, Daikonis Shashahani directly from this formula just by looking at the zero swap. And it, it's kind of cute, but um, I squandered my time, I think. 
Uh, okay, there's some uh, references and uh, I can put the slides up if, uh, if that's, I don't know if you do the slides or not. Yeah. If you're just looking at the video, it's not gonna help you to look at all those slides I skipped. Okay, um, thank you for listening and uh, that's all.